The Point of View is brought to you by Cowbell Coffee. Cowbell Coffee. Taste it. Love it. Kel Chaco Toothpaste. Kel Chaco. Happy Smile. Welcome to The Point of View. This is your favorite current affairs show on television, on City TV. On The Point of View, we usually get the right guests, ask them relevant questions on issues that matter to you. But every now and again, we do an editorial which tries to put a raging issue in perspective. And in our view, the biggest issue confronting the nation is the economy. So tonight, we'll be walking you through government's physical challenges. Fisc what really is wrong with government finances? Why do they owe so many people? Why are so many people clamoring for payment of their arrears? Why is government bent on passing the e-levy? Is that the solution to the fiscal challenges? What did they do wrong to get us here? And what can they do and what should they do to take us out of what many have described as a fiscal hole? I'll be back to take you through my plan for today. Stay with us. Wakes me up better than a cup of cowbell coffee. Delicious coffee aroma. Mmm. How can you forget your lines again? I'm sorry, sir. Just that it tastes really good. Cowbell coffee. Enjoy the delicious creamy coffee taste of three-in-one cowbell taste coffee. It love and love. It's a beautiful day. Oh. <laughs> this advertisement has been vetted and approved by the FDA. Welcome back. Tonight's show is an editorial. We're trying to give you a clearer sense of Ghana's fiscal situation. When we talk of fiscal, it's F-I-S-C-A-L, which really talks about how government manages its revenues and expenditures. So in terms of revenues, you typically look at taxation, and then, of course, you have indirect or direct taxes. Then you also borrow. Then, of course, expenditures is how government spends, usually on paying salaries and then on investments as well. Part of this is called recurrent expenditure, and part of it is called capital expenditure. So, first thing I'll do is to show you from the 2022 budget how precarious our situation is as a country. Now, in the 2022 budget, the government had a figure that they called the fiscal outlook for 2021, which really tells you the difference between how much money we're getting by way of revenue and how much we intend to spend by way of expenditure. Now, if you look at 2021, which is the previous year, the figures make for very startling reading. So government total revenue and grants is in terms of their projected outturn, which is the orange chart at the bottom, and then the revenue itself at the blue chart on the histogram at the bottom. So it's about 70 uh, billion. So usually they'll write 70,347 million, but that's 70 billion, right? So we, we were, we raised 70 billion cities. But look at how much we want to spend. That's the line above that. 111. The difference between the 111 and the 70 is what is called the, the basic deficit, the budget deficit. So if you do 111 minus 70, you get 41. So that's what the budget deficit is. That basically means that what you intend to spend is 41 
billion CDs more than what you raise. Your total revenue and grants is lower than your expenditure by 41 billion Ghana CDs. That's serious. All right. Now, if you can't raise all the money domestically, which is basically what we have at the bottom, typically what you do is that you borrow. You go to the international bond market. Before you became middle income, you could have gone to the IMF to borrow, which is what is called those non-concessionary loans and concessionary loans, depending on where you stand. The trouble is that the next chart shows us that we are not in a good position to even borrow. So look at our debt stock. Our external debt is the deep blue. Our domestic debt is the light blue. Look at how quickly it's grown. There's something they call debt to GDP ratio, 2017, 54. That means that if you put all our debt together and you sell everything in Ghana, <laughs> the amount of money we owe is 54% of all that we are worth. That's basic definition of debt to GDP ratio. Look at 2018. This has gone up to 56%. By 2019, our debt to GDP was 61%. That's not supposed to be that bad, right? But check it out. 2020, this rose to 76%. So between 2019 and 2020, our debt to GDP rose. Total debt stock, look at the figure on top there. 291 billion CDs. Guys, 291 billion is what we owe. Our total revenue we raised was just 70 billion. Now look at 2021 provisional. 341 billion Ghana CDs debt stock with a breakdown of 178 being external, 163 being domestic. So your debt to GDP ratio is close to 80% figure. Now, Conventional wisdom says if your debt to GDP rises above 70%, you're in trouble. So what this means is that we are not in a good position to borrow. You can still go and borrow, but they look at your debt to GDP ratio. They look at how much you, you raise domestically and say, we don't think you can pay. So we have to charge a premium on how much we lend to you because we have to guarantee that it's risky to lend to you. So all this controversy about Moody's, and all these people who are downgrading Ghana, it further worsens our ability to raise money from the international bond market. Those are commercial lenders. So again, if you are a low-income country, you can go to IMF, they'll give you money. They don't charge you such high rates. But once you become middle income, and once you start borrowing from the international markets, your position is a bit more difficult. So that's the, the basic situation with Ghana. Our public debt is very high. In fact, if you look at some of the ratings, they're basically saying we are a high risk debt distressed country. So our status is not good. So what does government do? Government needs money to bridge the deficit. Go back to the previous chart. Now, there are two things you can do. You can either raise the two lines at the bottom to meet the line in the middle, or you can reduce the lines in the middle <laughs> to match the line at the bottom. That's what is called cut your coat according to your size. Now, whether you raise the line at the bottom to meet the one in the middle, or you lower the line in the middle to raise the one at the bottom, whatever you do, the line in the top, the 41, goes down. But it's not that simple. Because what you spend the money in the middle to do, your expenditure, you pay people's salaries. You also owe people and the interest for those debts are due. So you can't say you won't pay. You are not a champion. You can't say you yeah. So you need to find money to pay people's interest. I'm not even talking about principal. If you add, and, in, and, I, and I show this when um, Joe Jackson was on the show, if you add what we spend on salaries for all workers and we add interest payments, that equals the line at the bottom. And if I have that chart, I'll show it to you. So basically, once you spend on your first two line items, all your revenue is finished. And now you can't borrow. So government is in a difficult situation. But who caused it? I'll come to that at the end. Because some people predicted this as far back as August 2019. And they were spot on as to what they said was going to happen to the economy if government did not change track. In fact, maybe I should read that story for you to start the conversation. Because I think it's, it's good to... to, to, to claw our way back, instead of telling you what the manifestation of this. So this is a story, citynewsroom.com wrote 
August 7, 2019. Ghana's fiscal path is unsustainable. IFS. I'm going to read the full story. The gentleman in the picture is called Leslie Dwight Mensah. He used to be a journalist at BNFT. He went to continue his education. He's now a policy analyst. I recall interviewing him some time back on this. Let me read what he says. He says the story says, Ghana's indebtedness is set to worsen on the back of government's current spending and borrowing decisions, making the country's fiscal policy path unsustainable, policy think tank the IFS has stated. After its assessment of the mid-year review of the 2019 budget statement presented to Parliament recently, the IFS said government must, quote, reverse course with a strategy that will reduce borrowing significantly in order to improve the debt dynamic, particularly with regard to the ballooning debt service costs. That means the cost of paying back the debts. The budget review notably made some fiscal policy changes, including energy and communication tax hikes and requests to spend more money. Then they break this down. Revenue targets were missed by 15.5%. The IFS observed that the revenue mobilization efforts had continued to miss projected targets with a shortfall of 4.2 billion CDs, representing 15.5%. According to the Institute, the missing of revenue target was not surprising. The think tank described as overambitious revenue forecasts made by government in the 2019 budget statement, given projected real GDP growth and inflation rates, as well as tax revenue giveaways that were not matched by strong offsetting measures. Now listen to this paragraph. This one is so interesting because it's something that happened recently. Don't forget, this is August 2019, four months or five months after the vice president announced the reduction in benchmark values in April at the College of Physicians. This is what Leslie Dwight Mensah says. The reduction in benchmark import values in April which narrowed the import tax base and contributed to 1.6 billion shortfall in customs receipts in the first half of the year is one example. So basically they were saying that decision to reduce import benchmark values cost us 1.6 billion CDs. The IFS also said that they were at a loss as to why the finance minister was silent on the tax exemptions bill which would curtail widespread exemptions in the country's tax regime when passed into law. There's a view that we grant too many tax exemptions to companies that don't keep their money here, and they always put pressure on the government. According to the IFS, the silence is puzzling, especially when the president in his 2019 State of the Nation address had portrayed a dire picture of the tax exemptions regime. Guys, we are in 2022. The tax exemptions bill has still not been passed. Right? Then they go on. The think tank projected a rise in budget deficit by some 1.2 billion. According to the IFS, debt service expenditure comprising interest and amortization payments absorbed 26.8% of total revenue and grants in 2013, but increased rapidly to 47.9% in 2016. The ratio the IFS projected will sharply rise to 51.2% this 2019 on account of the revisions made to spending in the mid-year budget. Then it goes, with the public debt stock at 204 billion, the one I showed you was over 300. At the time this report was filed, public debt was 204 billion. As of end June 2019, the IFS expressed worry that the debt situation would worsen in the face of unchanged revenue projection. And since the total supplementary request of 6.4 billion would be financed by debt, so all the extra money the supplementary budget was asking for were going to borrow to spend. We were warned. Mr. Mensah called for urgent steps to limit further borrowing and efforts to eliminate the extra budget expenditure and borrowing, despite this being excluded from the budget deficit. So you can say that we were warned. And this is IFS, Leslie Dwight Mensah's team, Professor Newman Kusi and Co. Quite excellent, prescient analysis. And this is where we are today. So the next question is, what is the manifestation of all of this. What does this mean for you? Because a lot of you think, ah, debt to GDP, I don't understand. Fiscal deficit, it doesn't pay for my electricity bill. A lot of you think this may just be big numbers. When we come back, I will show you what this thing I have read and what I've shown you in the two charts have meant for particularly public sector workers and government spending on critical sectors, roads, health, 
education, all of these sectors have suffered and are suffering because of where we are. Later on, I'll tell you whether the e-levy is the solution to all of this or whether there could be a better way. This is our editorial on the economy, on the point of view. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Welcome back to The Point of View. Tonight an editorial on the economy. We are asking, how serious is government's fiscal challenges? That is economic speak. In English, it means how broke are we? We've shown you the deficit figures. We've shown you our revenue and expenditure differences. And we've also told you that in 2019, people predicted this. People warned the government. But it appears they did not listen. Now, what does this mean for you? So many areas. Government programs have been affected by the situation we're in. Road sector has been affected. Education has been affected. Health has been affected. Agric has been affected. Other statutes have been affected. I'll walk through all. Let me give you an example. So, for example, government programs, NAPCO. As we speak, NAPCO trainees say they haven't been paid for five months. Indeed, NAPCO trainees have threatened to demonstrate. In fact, they have had to shift their planned demonstration to tomorrow. It was supposed to be today. But they've shifted it to tomorrow based on the police discussion with them. Now think about it, a NAPCO trainee earns 700 CDs a month. For five months, it's not been paid. Now, <laughs> let's assume you've spent 50 CDs to and from work every day, and you work for one month. The money is finished, right? And some of this goes back to prioritization in terms of payment. But one manifestation of the, the serious financial situation, or what people say, the brokenness or the brokerage of government, is that NAPCO trainees for five months have not been paid. And NAPCO salaries are not that high. NAPCO was introduced in 2017 as one of the flagship programs. A lot of noise was made about it, that NAPCO was going to be an innovative way of training people, paying them, and then facing them into other employments. Of course, when you listen to the government now, they are saying when they do use that, some of the NAPCO pool will be pushed in there. But that may not be the way. As we speak, a chief tenancy minister has written to NAPCO trainees and said them, said, basically said to the, the, chief, uh, the, the people in the ministry that they should not be maintained. So we don't know if this applies to other departments. So the NAPCO problem is one of the evidences of the challenge government is in. There was no problem with NAPCO, but the fact that for five months they've not been paid. But that's not all. Youth in afforestation, and I'm just using an annotated news report analysis of what government is going through on the basis of its own fiscal decisions. Youth in afforestation, they've not been paid for four months. How much are they paid? These are the guys who planted the one million trees under the Ministry of Lands. They've not been paid, right? Compare their salary to other people. How come they've not been paid? Is government's fiscal in such a bad situation that you can't pay youth in afforestation? There are a couple of stories in there. In fact, this week, one of the, the, the managers assured that they will be paid by end of the week. This was Tuesday. Today is Wednesday. The assurance is that they will be paid by Friday. But four months, youth in afforestation? But that's not even as bad as this one. Now, the LEAP is the Livelihood Empowerment uh, Program. This was introduced in 2008 by Kufuor. Over 300,000 households of extremely poor people, mostly rural women, have, are given stipends every couple of months. These stipends help them to pay medical bills, buy food to eat, pay rent, look after themselves. It's not a lot of money. Can you believe that LEAP Transfers have not been made since September 2021. We are, in, we are in February 2022. So it means that the, the November cycle was not paid, and then the January cycle has not been paid. So two cycles have not been paid. Imagine. Leap. And these are, I mean, you, you would think that if you are making payments for people in terms of salaries, you probably want to pay people with lower incomes first. But I'm not sure LIP can make noise. Maybe LIP people, they are old, poor people. They can't make noise. So they need people like Sengana. In fact, I'll, I'll tell you something. There's a story here. In May last year, Sengana demanded the release of LIP arrears to beneficiaries. And the last payment that was made was September. And as we speak, LIP beneficiaries have not been paid. This is serious, right? So because of government's fiscal position, we are, we are, we are saying... If you are not even going to pay people, it should not be leap people. 
It should not be NAPCO. It should not be youth in afforestation. Maybe MPs should take a, a salary freeze. Ministers, all right? Let those who are paid in the tens of thousands rather not be paid first. But you can't tell me that leap NAPCO and youth in afforestation. You know, so there's that. But that's not the only thing. Let's go to roads. I had a, an interview with the ranking member of the roads committee on radio yesterday. That's Kwame Agboja, MP for Adaklu. And then this morning, I spoke to the Kennedy Osenyakun, who's the MP for Akim Suedu, who is the chairman of the roads committee. Both confirmed that we owe contractors 8 billion CDs. 8 billion CDs. Apparently, the debt was 4 billion in 2017. It's now 8 billion. 8 billion CDs. Serious. Now, maybe, let, maybe let's listen to them so you know I'm not making this up. Let's listen to Agboja first. And then we'll listen to Kennedy Osenyaku just to corroborate the fact that Parliament has confirmed that the road fund and the road sector owes contractors eight billion cities. Let's listen to them. Well, it's quite uh, challenging. Um, based on the last uh, need the press the minister had, Coco Road, Coco Board alone uh, has awarded projects that are around fourteen billion Ghana cities, and I doubt how much money they have got to pay. You remember in the past, they were arguing and I actually went and instituted uh, an audit into Coco Road project under President Mahama and paid various sums uh, for that consultancy. As it turns out, the minister confessed that he did not even use any procurement process to select the auditor, which is another matter we can talk about later. Uh, the last time the ministry briefed the committee, uh, it appeared the ministry the, 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 obviously, Cocoa Roads don't fall under the ministry in terms of payment. Uh, the ministry's agencies, FIDA Road, Highway, Urban Road, do the consultancy for them, but the actual payment comes from the Cocoa, uh, Road, uh, the Cocoa Road Fund. The minister said that, they, I mean, according to the document, they were owing contractors to the tune of over $7 billion. My check last week suggests that that money has gone beyond $8 billion Ghana cities. Last week, on the floor of Parliament, answering, uh, I mean, during the reading of the, the business statement, I overheard the, uh, the deputy majority leader suggesting that they are going to, uh, this week, they are going to pay uh, some 75 million Ghana CD. Uh, to, uh, they are going to disperse that amount of money to road contractors. <laughs> you, you owe 8 billion. Uh, uh, maybe 4 billion of that is uh, money. Uh, the, the fund for those roads could have been coming from road fund alone. But the, the, the tragedy of the road fund is that the road fund generates about 2 billion Ghana City currently annually. Uh, out of that, about 80 million Ghana City come from the road toll. As you are aware, the out of capping, the capping act that the Ministry of Finance brought to Parliament, only about half of the road fund is, allow, is, is spent on road relief. So does that mean that if I have 100 cities coming to the road fund, yes, I'll only get 20 percent of that hundred. You get 80 percent. Ah, okay, I'll get 80 yes. percent, and then, then, the they of, then they will take uh, uh, Minister of Rules will, will have access to 80, 80 percent, and then finance then will take the 20 percent for other priority uh, things. Yes, and the, okay. the reason why finance is taking that 20 percent is well. one, there are some of the projects that are GOG that the finance ministry pays it from. It I, I get you after it. So, if you come for all the money, where do you want? Ministry of Finance to pay those GOG projects that are referred to the Ministry of Finance. So he keeps that money. As, okay. So when you when some certificates are sent, God, there are two certificates, GOG and road fund. So GOG goes to the Ministry of Finance. Then the road fund money is being kept at the road fund secretary. Why isn't GOG cheating me then if GOG is coming to take my road fund to pay GOG? Because GOG has other sources of funding. No, no, but road fund is only road it, fund. It's, it's road. All is road. So the Ministry itself, when it's awarding contract, do this in two parts. It does give some GOG and some to road fund. Mm -hmm. Because the ministry has only road fund. Yeah, that's but right. GOG has everything. Yes. So if, if it means more 80 now, 110 now, 100, then you will come and so, take 20 of that so to add to the ministry. The, so, uh, Bernard, it's like you want to construct 100 kilometers of road. The ministry, mm -hmm. that's what you want to do it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, many say, okay, with 100 kilometers, mm -hmm. I want to pay 80 with my road fund, the mm. twenty percent will be GOG. Yes. But the amount of money that is at the GOG, we need also support. Where is the revenue coming from to pay the twenty percent? 
Mm. The purpose of the road fund is to pay for the road that we are doing. I see. So the money some is sitting there. Government also add some to that GOG one mm. and pay. So is this thing is this capping in perpetuity or just for this year and next year? No, it we the capping started in 2017 and it's still in force. So okay. at the point we have been arguing. So it's a policy. This it's government a policy in, until government that the that finance minister is a better has a better sense yes. of the overall priority. Yes. So you heard them, right? Now, what makes this worse is that the main source of payment for the road sector is the road fund. There are two problems with the road fund. The road fund and other funds like the GET fund, NHIS fund, have all been capped. That means that if they get 100 CDs every month, for the road fund, the cap is at 80%. So they will pay 80 CDs into the road fund, 20 CDs will go into the consolidated fund for financial to use. Some people think that is not a good thing because the road fund itself needs more money. Now, what makes this worse is that yesterday, the chairman of the road fund board, MP for Futu, Afenyo Makin, was speaking about the e-levy. And he made a very startling revelation. Listen to what he said. Every one of us in the chamber of parliament, we've been talking about roads, that the deplorable nature of our roads. And today, Honorable Samsonai, talking about Bodhi roads. Obviously, we must have sustainable, dedicated, reliable source of funding. I chair the road fund. As we speak today, what is in the fund that next week we're going to disperse is just around 75 million cities. What can 75 million do? How many contractors are you going to pay? So the reality is that there are key aspects of the economy that we must look for reliable source of funding. You heard that for yourself. It was a longer speech. He was talking about e-levy and all that. But what caught my attention was, Afenyo Makin is saying, the road fund has only 75 million CDs in it. That's serious. We owe contractors 8 billion. <laughs> we are not even talking about 100 million. No. Only 75 million CDs is in the road fund which has already been capped. This is a serious problem. We've also suspended toll booth <laughs> collection in anticipation of e-levy. So you owe contractors $8 billion. 75 million is what you have in your road fund. You've suspended toll payments, and you've capped your road fund payment. So it means you are not even getting enough money. So GOG, through finance machine, must look for money to pay these contractors. And we know the spillover effect. Once you owe contractors... They owe suppliers. Suppliers owe whatever. The road economy is one of the economies that moves through, especially when they are local contractors. So if you owe contractors 8 billion cities, that is serious. 8 billion cities in debt. Road fund doesn't have enough money. Okay. Now, let's go to another sector which is reeling from the government's fiscal challenges, education. And this one, I won't even talk much. Let me take you to Kumasi. Yesterday, the conference of heads of assisted senior high schools, CHAS, had a meeting with the education minister. Listen to what they said. The meeting was to enable managers of schools to put across their concerns to the education minister for solutions. President of CHAS, Alhaji Yaqub Abubakar, says the supply of food must be done in full complement to avoid disruption of academic activities in senior high schools. We've already made them aware that we need to sit and do proper planning and ensure that some of these things go to the schools before school reopen. That way you can do a better management of your school. Or else for now you will find a lot of heads engaged in the issues of food. When heads should rather concentrate to see how they can get quality outcomes as far as education is concerned at our school levels. So we are hoping that the authorities will listen to us and moving forward, it wouldn't happen this way again. Before the schools are open, food are brought to the school, monies are brought to the school, then we can take off very smoothly. Charles is also concerned about the inadequate furniture and beds in senior high schools for students. Some schools cannot even receive Form 1s if they are not supplied with furniture before the Form 1s come to school. We've made them aware of that. Beds, 
in the various dormitories are also in short supply. We've drawn their attention to that. Then benches and tables at the dining hall. You know, previously, parents were helping us to get these things all. But with the inception of the fridge, it says, it is now the burden on government to provide all these. So we've made them aware that they should ensure that we get this. Or else, the form ones may come to school and they will not have furniture to sit in the classrooms. They will be in the dormitories and will not have bed to sleep on. And we don't like such a thing to happen. The minister here, too, has given us the assurance that they will work and ensure that these things are brought to the schools before the 4th of April when the fun ones will be expected in our schools. Education Minister Dr. Yao Osei Edichum assured government will address these concerns. Uh, the key opportunities uh, is the fact that we are all coming up with new ways of making sure that they get the resources that they need uh, to run their schools well. Of course, like any human institution, uh, some may talk about when is the f uh, food distribution, and we set up a system that will enable us to track uh, the food distribution. One thing that is going to be done this year is that uh, we are now going to give them the list of all the food items that they should be receiving. So if the items are not in, they will be able to know that we're supposed to get 1,000 bags of rice, we have this amount, and therefore uh, the buffer stock should be giving us are the remainder, and then we can all work together on it. So that's a new way of doing business in terms of food supply in our schools. The leadership of CHAS says it will continue to engage government in the provision of needed logistics to enhance teaching and learning in senior high schools across the country. Half is to journey, City News, Kumase. So you heard it. The Head of Chas says, if they don't get food this week, <laughs> today is Wednesday, if they don't get food this week, they will not reopen and uh, they will not admit new form ones. This is serious. And he's also asking for furniture. We raised this point on radio earlier. What is going on with the schools? Now, there are two quick points there. Usually, government pays 30% money to school heads for what they call the perishables. So, for example, the... Um, cassava dough, corn dough, and stuff. But there's also non-perishables that the buffer stock company supplies to the schools. Now, apparently, the buffer stock is owed over 300 million cities as well. Now, buffer stock works with suppliers. So if buffer stock <laughs> doesn't have money, they won't come out and tell you they don't have money. But buffer stock cannot pay suppliers. Suppliers too will threaten not to supply the food. So the non-perishables, your sardine, your cooking oil, your milk powder, and all those things will not be sent to buffer stock, for buffer stock to send to the schools. So the schools have two problems. They may not have money for the perishables. Buffer stock cannot supply the non-perishables. So you notice a lot of parents are complaining. The kids are looking emaciated. It's all because of where we are. And you see, so this is the real economy. A lot of times when we talk about fiscal numbers and we are doing all these arguments over economic jargon, this is the real economy, right? So Chas wants food and desk. Buffer stock is owed, I'm told, 350 million. And as if this is not enough, School feeding caterers, as of last year, they got payment for the second term of the previous year. Now they're saying they need payment for the third term. And school feeding was introduced again under the Kufour government. This is a one CD per student for basic schools. One CD per student for basic schools. And we owe caterers the whole of third term. In fact, the last payment was made was 31, uh, 31 million CDs for the second term payment. Imagine. So secondary school kids risk not getting enough food. Basic school, school feeding for basic schools also, if the payments are not made, caterers. And then I, as if all this is not enough, all the strikes we are hearing, they are money related, right? So UTAG is on strike. Why are they on strike? They say they, the market premium payment that they are owed since 2013 must be paid. These are legacy issues. Even though the court has asked them to go back the indication is that they may not go. And it's not just UTAG. I've not even added UTAG to this list. CTAG, they claim there are arrears between 2017 and 2020. That's three-year arrears. This is the College of Education Teachers. In fact, their recent strike was based on these area issues. All right? Then there's also the TEU. Earlier in the year, TEU threatened strike. What was the strike over? They call it professional development allowance. So one education. There's Charles asking for food and desk, buffer stock, School feeding caterers, CTAG areas, TEU professional development, UTAC strike, all in education. 
So you don't have to be a government worker to feel this. Because if students are not getting food, your, students are, your, your children are involved. So the manifestation of the problem we are seeing is in the educational sector. But it doesn't end there. Let's go to the agri sector. And the agri sector for me is a very troubling one. Because like education, it touches all of us. Now, according to the Peasant Farmers Association, 60% of fertilizer suppliers have not been paid. I'm going to actually read a story for you to justify this because I don't want you to think I'm making this up. This is a BNFT story. More than 60% of fertilizer suppliers for PFJ remain unsettled. February 4, this is just two weeks ago. The majority of fertilizer distributors, more than 60% of them, are yet to receive payment for input distributed in government flagship planting for food and jobs program during the 2021 crop season. The PFAC has said, in view of this trend, which is growing into a norm, the PFAC has expressed fear that the phenomenon of food shortages as well as exorbitant pricing of foodstuffs, which plague consumers across the country in 2021, could be repeated this year if farmers still have struggled to get inputs. Right? Then let me move in a story. It says, despite the upsurge in allocation, data from the Food and Agri Ministry indicates that government owes fertilizer importers some $149 million. Not see this all. $149 million since the beginning of 2020. This is serious. Out of the amount, just $36.9 million was paid in July. So government still owes fertilizer suppliers over $100 million. Convert that to CDs. Almost $700 million. It says, as we speak, most fertilizer companies, more than 60%, have still not received payment for the inputs they were, that were delivered under Planting for Food and Jobs in 2021, not to mention the 2020 arrears. He explained that government needs to put in measures to ensure that what happened in 2021 has not repeat this year. And he says, if government doesn't pay quickly, Input distributors might be reluctant to bring what is required for farmers. And then what does this mean? We will have challenges planting. Now, in fact, already the PFAC is saying that there's rising cost of fertilizer on the open market. Right? Smallholder farmers will be disadvantaged. They will not purchase enough uh, inputs. It's a serious issue. There was a tussle between the finance ministry and the agri ministry. But guys, over $100 million owed 60% of fertilizer farmers, fertilizer suppliers. That's very serious. But this is not just agri. Let's go to health ministry. We are reliably informed that there is at least 10 months arrears for NHIA. The last payment was somewhere in July 2021. We stand to be corrected here. Right? But we are told that, and the reason the NHIA, we haven't had a lot of noise, is that some of the, uh, the, the, the suppliers and the hospitals, the facilities, they are charging cash and still asking NHI to pay how much they owe. Do you understand? So it's almost like since the monies are not going to come, we will, we will charge. This is serious. So on the health side as well, and don't forget, earlier this year or late last year, GMA sent a communicate to the government reminding the government that the deadline for paying some arrears was due. This is Justice Youngson and Co. They basically said to government that the deadline for you to pay our outstanding arrears is very close. And if you don't pay, it could lead to a strike. So you have NHIA, and then you have Ghana Medical Association. Then let's, let's go to other statutory payments. So this is Assembly Common Fund. Now, let me explain this briefly. So because government's fiscal year does not always coincide with the normal calendar year, the, the DACF will always be in arrears. But as we speak, the last payment that was received by the district assemblies was 50% of quarter two for last year. 50% of quarter two for last year, right? So we are in quarter one of 2022. District assemblies have been given up to 50% of quarter two for last year. So we are talking about the quarter that started April, May, June. 50% of that. So July, August, September, quarter three has not been paid. October, November, December, quarter four has not been paid. We are in 2022, quarter one. As for that one there, we don't know where it is. So think about it. If you're a district assembly, you have a plan to do. You want to drain some gutters. You want to do some cleanup. You've received 50% of quarter two. 
This is not good enough. As we speak, during the radio show in the morning, some workers said that they were reliably informed that their SNIT payments had not been paid. And this was at least in four months' arrears. We, we, we are yet to verify this. But some third-party insurance companies and companies that, for example, a, a worker goes to borrow money from a bank, his deduction has to be made from controller. They're basically saying that for the past three months, third-party deductions at controller have not been made. So maybe I have an insurance product, I have to pay 100 CDs every month as a, a government worker. For three months, that payment has not been made. We don't know whether it's a technical issue with gift miss or whether it's a lack of money issue. So clearly, the government's finances are looking very difficult. There are other areas we don't have time to go into. When we come back, we will look at this e-levy proposal from government. We think that the e-levy is not the answer. And we, we, we think e-levy is not the, the answer to government fiscal challenges. We know government needs money. But if we look at government projections and the level of taxes we pay in terms of indirect tax and the potential effect of e-levy on a very strategic economy like technology, we don't think e-levy is the answer. But we're not here just to just complain. We have some alternatives. We think government can do so much more to resolve this very precarious economic situation it finds itself in by its own doing. When we come back, we'll touch some of those points. Stay with us. Welcome back to The Point of View. Tonight, we're doing an editorial on the state of Ghana's economy. Ghana's fiscal situation is in dire straits. It's in difficult shambles. We don't have enough money. Our deficit is over, uh, I don't know, we have at least a 40 billion deficit that we have to pay for. And the manifestation of government's financial difficulties is in all sectors I've shown you, from the uh, road sector to the health sector to the agri sector to the education sector, to government programs. All of this is because of the government's fiscal situation. Now, the ELEV is being projected. I mean, for example, there was a video we saw of um, Honorable Befi, right? He's the MP for New Job in South. He was talking to Michael and He says, ELEV is the answer for roads. ELEV, free SHS. ELEV, from all the projections, even if everybody pays the ELEV as projected, you get 6 billion CDs. That's $1 billion. The road sector alone, you owe $8 billion. Right, I haven't, there are so many, you owe fertilizer, there are so many things you owe. So ELV is being pitched to solve the problem of youth unemployment through youth start, and then essentially to provide infrastructure. Now, I disagree with even the youth start. Why? Because the history of government initiated employment programs has been abysmal, from NYEP to GDA to LESDEP to LESDEC to Maslock. It's been a cocktail of mismanagement. Now, look at NAPCO. People are owed six months. You think this, you think that. What is the, what is the, the guarantee that if you did E-Levy and you started doing you start, it will not end up like one of those previous ones? So the money itself, unless the E-Levy is supposed to be used for some collateralization, which we have a problem with as well, the E-Levy of six billion will cause more harm to the technology sector. So that's the first point. I mean, I always give this a, a comparison. Look at MTN Momo. Look at the number of people employed, over 300,000 people. How many of them came to become MTM Momo workers through a government employment program? Look at Uber drivers. These are all private sector initiatives which government policy allows. So government focus must be on policy space. Create the policy environment. Let the MTNs and the Vodafones of this world create business. Then people get jobs. Same with the Ubers and the boats of this world. A government program by its very nature is bound to abuse so I am not very confident in you start. That's point number one. Point number two, citizens are already feeling the pinch. We are struggling. Fewer prices have been projected to reach eight cities by end of month. Per liter. Per liter. Eight cities. According to COPEC, the next pricing window, which starts today, we are going to reach 7.4, 7. Point something. And by end of March, if things don't change, eight cities per liter. Fewer affects everything. Second point, I'll read a story for you. This is not me. Statistical service, city business news. Two days ago, actually four days ago, rent and transport associated prices pushed inflation to almost 14%. 
Let me read the story. A significant increase in prices associated with housing, water, electricity, gas, and other fuel, as well as transport, has pushed the rate of inflation for January to 13.9%. Inflation is the rate at which prices are increasing. This is the CPI release for January. Now, this is the, the, the killer. The rise in inflation rate for January 2022 is the highest recorded in Ghana since Statistical Service rebased the Consumer Price Index in August 2019. Let me repeat. The rise in the inflation rate for January is the highest recorded since the Ghana Statistical Service rebased the Consumer Price Index in August 2019. This was the same time IFS was warning government. You see how it works. So clearly they didn't listen. So now the chickens have come home to roost. Inflation is 14%. 13.9 is essentially 14%. The highest since rebasing. What does that mean? Everything you buy is more expensive. That's what it means. So already you are reeling from fewer price hikes, which have pushed rent up, pushed transport costs up. Transport companies say they want 30% increase in transport fares. You are paying more for electricity, pay more for water, pay more for housing, pay more for fuel. And this is not me. This is statistical service. I just showed you their latest release. Okay. Then transport fare hikes. To make matters worse, the currency is depreciating. Here's a story by Charles Nixon Yeboah, my joint online, 10 January. CD to end 2022 at 7.03 to the dollar. Can you imagine? This is serious. Charles Nixon Yeboah says the Ghana CD is expected to end the year at 7.03 to the dollar. The Center for Economic Finance and Inequity Studies, Inequality Studies has projected. According to the center, its forecast of the end year depreciation of the CD to the dollar is 99% accurate. Charlie, seven CDs. Imagine if you have a mortgage, which you'll be paying when you started at around Kufour time. The mortgage was around, maybe CD dollar was around 1.5. It's now seven. And this has gone through all. This is serious. Right? So the reason e levy is not the answer is that students are already suffering from fuel price, inflation, transport fare hikes, currency depreciation. Worker salaries have not increased. There was an initial proposal of 4% increase. Now they said 7%. Very, can you imagine? Salaries are not going up. Even here, we are struggling to raise salaries to pay. So now you have flattened the salary for over a year. Okay? E-Levy, in our view, will disrupt a growing economy, will become a nuisance, and will affect a lot more poor people than wealthy people. So, what is our proposed solution? Well, I have five free pieces of advice. Number one, government must go back to cutting waste. Go to parliament, go to ministries, V8, plenty. We are not being cynical. A country that is broke shouldn't be riding around in V8 in Accra for what? Funeral? Have a pool of V8. Anybody wants to go to a funeral which is official, let them hire one. Go to parliament and see how they... And some of them, the drivers are still inside and the car is breathing. In fact, you can sell all those V8 and build three hospitals or more. We, we are wasteful. Government is too big. We spend too mu much money on things that are not necessary. You've not paid NAPCO. You've not paid youth in afforestation. You've not paid LEAP. Why are you paying ministers? If there's no food in the house, who doesn't eat first? Isn't it? Yes. So you can't tell me that. What, how many months arrears are ministers' salaries? Why haven't you paid NAPCO? Pay them. If you want us to all pay, if you want us to sacrifice, then the people who shouldn't be paid first are the people in government. Then the MPs will follow. Then pay the drivers, pay the security men, pay the NAPCO. Then we can say we are cutting, but don't, don't you've not paid NAPCO for six months. What are you and trust me, the 700 cities NAPCO cannot even fuel one V8 for one week properly. If you if you put if you if you put 700 cities. Somebody has a product. He has sometimes pay 800 cities to fill his tank. You, you understand my point? And that's somebody's fuel. We, we all work is not equal. I'm not, here to, I'm not here to hate on MPs, but I'm saying that if you want us to cut our quota according to our size, start with leadership. Number two, the import benchmark value reversal that we believe was a mistake to reduce. The reversal is a good policy. Be bold. Implement it. What are you afraid of? AGI has come out to say that it will make us more competitive. Why have you not implemented it? You're afraid of Guta? Is it because of what? No, implement it. Because research, I just read what Leslie IFS showed us. Implement the reversal. And let, let it happen and let the chips fall where they may. That's how you do it. 
Don't back down and then let importers. Today in the graphic, there was a story that one importer of rice and sugar had invaded, invaded taxes to the tune of 300 million cities since 2012. He hasn't paid taxes, according to the prosecution. He's, going, he's, he's in court for, for, for abusing government-bonded warehouse. Graphic page 19 or so. Check it out. 300 million cities. One company. One company. Do you understand? So what, what, are you, what are you doing? What are you afraid of with importers? Number three, property tax. Every day we ask property tax. Oh, we are doing property valuation. Property tax is a progressive tax. If you want to show us you want revenue, tax all. There are houses in cantonments nobody lives in. People are selling houses for $1.5 million. How much are they paying for property tax? And then you are saying, I should, me, the poor man, should suffer. No. Collect property tax first. Tax exemptions bill. You have not implemented it. You want alternatives? I've given you four. The tax exemption bill, 2019, as we speak, it's not been passed. Companies bring in goods ostensibly to come and build factories here. What do they do? For some reason, they, they apply for massive amounts of tax exemptions. Are we even able to track how much? Look at the currency pressure. Look at all the money they send back to their mother countries. We are not against foreign investment. But we can't, if the government wants to show us that, this economic plan will benefit all of us. There are easier examples to do. Implement the benchmark value reversal, cut the waste, tax property, implement the tax exemptions bill, widen the tax net, but not through e-levy. Not through e-levy. And pay the lower people first. The government fiscal situation is real. We are not denying it. We are not saying go to IMF. I really think that's really a red herring. The point is that government must begin to show its commitment to cutting its cost according to its size. Not by taxing us more, but by leading by example. We hope you've learned something from today's editorial. Thank you for watching. We are happy to hear from you. If we made any mistake, you feel you have facts to correct us, email me, benkoku at gmail.com. We'll be happy to read your rejoinders. We are happy for discussion to go on. We think government has more it can do to salvage this very precarious economic situation it's in. The e is not the answer. Thank you very much.